Hello, everybody. I'm here today to talk about shame and sexuality with author Michael Bach. I'm very excited to have him. And uh, he should be here in a second to sign in. Um, and I'm very excited about this Instagram Live. Today, um, today we're going to be talking about shame and sexuality. And also, very, very excited to announce that um, I am, um, I am now, uh, launching an educational platform called, um, uh, on, uh, on, uh, Mighty Networks. I'm really, really excited. Um, go, go live with the Michael Bach. Okay. Hopefully this is more. Um, Mighty Networks is a platform for me to, talk all about shame and education, host webinars. So I'm really hoping um, all of the people today will sign up. Um, and that's in my link tree. And here I am now with Michael. Hi, how are you? Great, how are you? Good. Awesome. So, you know, I'm, I'm known as the shameless psychiatrist because I'm all about parenting, living without shame. Michael, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and, and then we can get started with the conversation. Well, I'm an Aquarius. I like long one. No, that's the wrong one. Um, <laughs> I am a so-called diversity expert. I work in the fields of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. I've been in this space for 15 years. Um, I now run an organization called the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion. And I live in Toronto. That's so great. And, 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 uh, and, Tell me a little bit about uh, your experience. I know you're working on a new book, too, mm -hmm. around, you know, sexuality. But tell me about your experience um, with that topic and, and sort of how we can have an interesting conversation about. Uh, so I'm gay. I came out as gay in um, 18 something. No, it's been 33 years since I came out which, you know, 1980-something was not the kindest time for mm -hmm. people from the LGBTQ communities. And at the same time, I was always really active in the community. I felt like, in some ways, my sexuality really defined me and shaped my life. Because, mm -hmm. you know, let's face it, like, people were getting killed on the streets for being queer. Yeah. Um, I also identify as cisgender and yet gender non-conforming, which kind of mm -hmm. confuses the heck out of people. Um, so I have my own journey around gender, which has been relatively recent for me. Um, and I parlayed all of that into a career about 15 years ago. And I do a lot of work in the LGBTQ space, um, really helping uh, employers understand uh, how to create inclusive spaces for their uh, sexually and gender diverse employees. Um, amazing. Um, so can you explain to us when you say gender non-conforming, what do you mean? And also, can you tell me how you create that space? <laughs> Two questions. <laughs> you don't want the cure to cancer? I mean, that seems easy. Um, I mean, it's quick. Just right? Quick. So, um, so I'm cisgender, meaning that I identify with the sex that I was assigned at birth. When I was born, doctor looked down, saw penis, said, boy, I, I'm good with my penis. I like my penis. I like others liking my penis. <laughs> no desire to have any form of gender affirmation surgery. At the same time, I don't fit the stereotypical masculine box of what a man should be. You know, we have all sorts of societal norms about masculinity, and I just don't tick most of them. I'm uh, more feminine. I'm comfortable with my feminine side. I, I wasn't always. It took me a very long time to really become comfortable with the femininity in me. And uh, I was doing some research online, you know, struggled for years to sort of find the box that I fit in, to find my tribe. And then I, I, you know, 
frankly, there was a, there's an actor um, who uh, he also identifies as cisgender, gender nonconforming. And I was like, oh, gosh, wait, I didn't know we could be both. And it really ticked for me about that I didn't have to be one or the other. I could be both and I can be comfortable in my femininity and, and I can be comfortable not being the hyper masculine man that my parents probably always wanted me to be. Um, now to your second question, that's a little more complicated. Um, you know, working with employers around creating inclusive spaces is, it, it can be pretty challenging because in some cases, this is kind of the last bastion of inclusion. I think it's also really important to note that just because it's an inclusive space for one doesn't mean it's an inclusive space for all. And what I mean by that is, you know, as a cisgendered white man, as a member of the, the LGBTQ communities, I'm, I'm pretty much part of the family now. Like, there's, there's not as much resistance to my existence. But if I was a person of color, if I was trans, if I was a trans person of color, it's not so good. Um, and it's, you know, I think one of the biggest hurdles is helping employers understand the intersectionality of it, where yeah, they're cool with me and they, they love me and they think I'm fabulous and all that stuff. And that's great. Yeah, I am very fabulous. But understand that there's layers there and that, you know, queer people of color, queer trans people of color, they're, it's not the same thing. And we need to take that into consideration. That's the first hurdle. I think a lot of employers, uh, and a lot of people I know, parents, because I work a lot with parents, uh, are just prefer to avoid the whole thing because they're so afraid of stepping on someone's shoes. They don't even know the language. They don't understand. There's so many acronyms. Like a lot of people just feel intimidated and it comes out of a, most people, it comes out of a good place. It's not like, you know, necessarily racism or discrimination. It's just confusion. And, and, you know, when you're scared or shamed by something, you just avoid and yeah. so it's kind of like, how do we help them come out of their closet, you know, and, and embrace, um, embrace all these new names and acronyms and situations without offending people. So how do we give advice to like, like say a white woman or, you know, uh, cisgender, heterosexual, like, or a man, like, how do we sort of say like, it's okay to screw up and say the wrong thing. Like, not everyone's going to be walking on eggshells. Like if you're genuinely interested and empathetic, it's going to be taken well. And that's what I, that's the advice I can give. I think that's great advice. I think, you know, on one hand, people have to be willing to risk. Mm -hmm. People ha have to be willing to look like stupid, right? Like look that they don't know the answer. And most people aren't terribly comfortable with the idea of that, right? Looking like they don't have all the answers. Just because you watch RuPaul's Drag Race doesn't make you an expert <laughs> in the LGBT community. I mean, you could say, I'm yeah. I'm an expert, and I'm still confused sometimes. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it's confusing. It's like, they're... Time. And, the, and the teenagers are always up-leveling me. Oh, my gosh. In so many ways, right? I, this is my first Instagram Live, and I feel like I'm 100 years old. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, it's that openness, that willing to learn that willingness to not make it about you. I know I, I've met some people who are like, well, why would my child possibly want to have surgery to remove their genitals? Okay, wait, at what point do we stop thinking about our children's genitals? Because it really should come early on. <laughs> and, and it's not about you. It's not about you as a parent, as a boss, as a friend. It's about the individual's journey. So we, we you know, have that openness. I would also say that there is an onus on people like me, on people within the community, to be open to others making mistakes, to misgendering well, that's them. That sort of thing. Like we can't just, I think we do, in general, people like me and you are very liberal, do tend to shame people 
when they when they don't think like you do instead of being like do you have any questions to ask me about this or can i help you with the yeah. terminologies or with the pronouns or because that would go a long way absolutely and we need to do that we need to have that willingness to say right you know my my gender pronouns are are they them not he her i would prefer it if you would just identify me as them and not jump down someone's throat, not attack them, not make them feel bad because they make a mistake. It's not like there's a course. It's not like you can, you know, go to the learning annex and learn all about being LGBTQ. Is the learning annex still a thing? I don't even know <laughs> if that's still a thing. <laughs> so, how old am I? So we just need that openness. We need that willingness to just be open and be like, yeah, you know, I don't understand this or it's okay. You don't understand. I always, when I'm ever I'm presenting, I always start by like, listen, this is a safe space. You can say whatever you like. I'll help you learn. And it's okay if you don't understand what it means to be gender nonconforming or to be cisgender or queer or two spirit. It's okay. This is a space where we can help you learn. And I think we as a community should be more open to that. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And, um, also be more accepting if the person that you are dealing with, like, you know, my, my grandfather, he's never going to make the change, you know, but it doesn't mean he doesn't won't generally still be a decent human being. I mean, he, he told me, you know, oh, I think it's so strange that your friends have two dads. Like, that's just unnatural. I'm looking at him like, oh, geez, you know, but okay. I, you know, and I just say like, you know, well, there's all new types of families now, you know, it's like half my book. And, um, but I'm not going to spend an hour wasting my brother getting upset about it. Like there are also a certain group of people are just not going to change, but it doesn't mean they're bad people. No, I don't think it means they're, I mean, the, there are definitely some bad people in the world. Um, <clears throat> former presidents. Um, yeah, I, I, there are some people though, that frankly, you know, they're just beyond help. And, I don't want to say there's an age component to it because that's not necessarily fair, but sometimes you look at people and go, you're not open to the learning. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and that's like my grandmother, um, yeah. she used to call me the homo. <laughs> the friend of Dorothy. I love that on the Royals. Yeah. It wasn't quite meant that way. She was just <laughs> like, she'd say to my father, Oh, how's the homo? <laughs> yeah. You're a bitch. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there was no changing her perspective. And sometimes that's okay, too. Yeah, and it's not, obviously not what we want, but I really think tolerance and acceptance, you know, and trying to educate from a good place. But when it comes to the workplace, right, um, I do think, obviously, some education around diversity, which your book, you know, talks about, is amazing. And what do you suggest that employers do broad strokes for their employees to promote more of this diversity education and diversity in general. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's important to have an understanding of the complexity of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I work with a lot of employers that, that don't sort of get the full depth and breadth of the conversation whether that's around sexuality or gender or ability or whatever, you name it, race. Um, th there has to be a lot of willingness to learn and accept and, and unlearn and accept that you don't have all the answers. And, you know, when we are working with employers, we start with what's your business case? What's the, the foundation of the why? Why do you need to focus on this? Why does it matter? And then we work them through an assessment process. What's the problem you're trying to address? Like it's a, it's a fair, we take a fairly, you know, pardon the expression, but business sort of focused approach. And then we eventually get to the point to say, okay, well, you're going to need to do some education. You're going to need to educate your people on what inclusion looks like and their role in creating that inclusive environment. And by the time we get to that point, they're usually pretty open. Mm -hmm. You know, they're usually willing to accept what's going on. And it's not perfect, but they start, 
you know, I, I sort of think of it as, as uh, pushing a ball up a hill. And eventually you get to the top of the hill and the ball starts to go down on its own. And that's generally where we get employers to. It's not perfect. They're always going to screw up and make mistakes. And it happens far too frequently. Although, you know, if they didn't, I wouldn't get paid. Um, and, but they start to, to realize things on their own, which is always a, a nice place to get them to. So I have a friend who's the CEO of a huge company and, and he told me that all this co- is, is, you know, during Black Lives Matter and all these things that is, 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 it's a computer programming company and they were saying we need to hire more people of different races. And he said to me, he said to me, it's so hard, it's so short-sighted because, you know, great, do you know anyone? Like, you know, because everyone thinks that the CEO can just do it, but to try, not that many applicants that are African-American and computer programmers, like there are just not that many of them in the world. And, you know, <clears throat> the company would love to hire one, but he can't make them out of air. So it, it becomes extremely complicated. So now he just says, he just pushes it right back on the employer. Sure, we'd love that. Send me your you know, friends who are black resumes, well, well, we'd love to hire someone like that. And yeah. it's fun because that kind of shuts people up a little bit because it, it is a really tough, it's tough, you know, it's tough to be. So how do you manage that? I mean, obviously, if you have a company that has good benefits and you're a great company, you can attract more diversity. But, you know, it almost like we have to, we have to do it from the ground up and, and educate people better and, you know, create yeah. them of a competent work, you know, racially diverse workforce. Provided the systems themselves are equitable. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, you know, I get that question a lot. Like, where can we find more people of color with this skill? Like, well, they're not hiding from you. <laughs> they're not like, oh no, it's, I can't, I'm, I'm going to hide it. It's not, that's not a thing. They're not doing that. But it's, are they getting through the process of hiring? And they've done lots of studies on this, particularly around name whitening. And they, the studies show, I forget what the statistics are exactly, but it's a ridiculous number that, you know, a person with an ethnic sounding name, someone who's African American, um, someone who is um, uh, Latinx, someone is a, a Asian Pacific Islander, you know, has a, a whether it's, let's say, Ken Chan, you'd think, okay, Asian Pacific Islander. That same person submitting the exact same resume with simply changing their name, there's something like 20 times more likely to get a job interview. It's just, uh, it's just a ridiculous uh, number. And okay, Kate Katz Fitz says, I loved how you talked about it. Thank you, appreciate the shout out. Um, My book. Just, you know, just going to casually have this sitting here. How's that? No, that's tacky. Um, the, the bit, birds of all feathers. Birds of all feathers, doing diversity and inclusion right. Available wherever you buy books, as long as they're selling mine. Um, uh, the systems are in place. The way we get people into jobs are themselves somewhat flawed. And we have to be willing to kind of dismantle those to figure out if there is a barrier to access. Like you should be tracking the, the identity, the demographics of the applicants. And then you should be looking at who gets screened in and who gets an interview and who gets hired so that you know if they're, where things fall apart. And your friend might find that there's you know, African-American people applying to the jobs, but they're not getting screened in. And until you start collecting that data, you don't know what you don't know. Good point. That's an interesting thing. Like how are they, and creating more objective systems to get people through the application process in the beginning. Yeah. To, you know, get diverse, at least getting the, through the interview process. I love that idea. It's a good idea. Um, and talking more about sexuality, because that's my passion, you know, uh, you know, if you have, you know, trans people in the workforce, um, how do you deal with the workplace environment, like, to make them feel more comfortable or to make the employer, because I think a lot of, the problem I'm seeing, even being a woman, this is true, 
we've now created this climate where everyone's so afraid to get sued um, and so afraid to say the wrong thing that there is no like corporate Christmas party anymore and people don't yeah. want to have a drink after work. They're just terrified, you know, to get sued. I sue, you know, I see what happens, you know, especially if you're a white man, you're like terrified of being even alone with a female employee, you know, forget a trans employee, you know, you yeah. freak out. And it's like, how do we manage that? How do we, you know, deal with that corporate climate issue? I find that to be so disheartening, right? That that is happening. And I heard that from so many Oh, I, listen, after Me Too kind of blew up, the number of men that I heard from who said, I'm just, I'm not going to be ever in a private situation with a woman. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow, that is the wrong answer. Yeah. Just don't try to screw them. Yeah. Let, let's just go there. We don't need to sexualize every woman. Um, believe me, they are not sexualizing you. Um, I, I you know, I think that's a bit disheartening. It's unfortunate, and, but it is a reality. With inviting and welcoming trans people into the in, into your workplace, though, is is really a big culture shift. It is a a huge change of um, in, in terms of getting away from the concept of gender as a binary. When you look at your hiring documentation, we, you know, every employer has to ask the question about, it's supposedly gender, it's not, it's sex, and that is male, female. There's no other options. Um, we use terminology like he, she, instead of they, them. We say maternity leave instead of parental leave. Like the whole system is built around the binary. So you have to do a bit of dismantling of the workplace and you know it's different there's two different scenarios there's one where you're dealing with someone who is transitioning on the job and then there's one where they are transitioning uh or they've transitioned before or they're not transitioning that's the other piece of the puzzle right like not every person who is is trans under this big umbrella of trans is going to do go through any form of gender affirmation surgery. They're not necessarily going to take home hormones. They're not gonna necessarily gonna have surgery. You know, some people present in, in a non-binary way, meaning you don't know if they're necessarily identifying as a woman or a man. Like it, it is, those are the types of situations you're dealing with. So I think you have to look at every single system and figure out where there is an opportunity for a change. Um, your washrooms, as an example. Yeah. This, this is the number one issue, is washrooms. I mean, I think the washrooms, and you have, obviously have, you know, um, more inclusive washrooms. Um, and then it's like, but also, I think it would be great as part of your corporate culture to have some kind of, you know, socialization within your corporation that is really friendly to everyone. like. Friday, you know, drinks after work, the boss pays for, you know, everyone to have a beer together, like, you know, as a group and everyone can go and try to keep it, you know, I don't know. I just think we shouldn't be so scared of, because I think it's only through the process of actually getting to know a trans person can you get over your fear of, of, of you know, talking with them, you know, of, of connecting with them socially and on a human level. And if we just keep everything all business all the time, that doesn't really create a great corporate culture either. I agree. The social aspect is really important. I, I think it's important to not put the onus on the trans person to be the educator. So the employer has to take the initiative to do some education around gender and, and gender variations. But then, yeah, be social with people, get to know them. And one of my closest friends is trans and I've known her for 15 years. She was the first, really the first trans person I got close to. And she had a willingness to be my educator, which, you know, bless her heart. Like it, so many people shouldn't have to take on that role. And she was so kind to do it for me. Um, but subsequently then I learned a whole lot about gender on my own. And, you know, it's a matter of, of uh, getting to know somebody and it personalizes it and changes your perspective on 
how, you know, that, that people are just human, right? Um, that they, they just want to exist. We all want the same thing innately. And getting to know someone really puts a, a face to a situation like that. Well, I think, um, I think, you know, we all harbor a lot of shame about sexuality and all of us, especially, I'm sure, most of the gender non-conforming community because imagine growing up with that and, you know, putting that on yourself. So, I don't know. It's like, I think that was the antidote to shame is vulnerability, you know? So it's like making yourself vulnerable and saying, like, I'm sorry, I don't know this, or I'm sorry, I keep screwing up the pronouns, even though you told me I'm having trouble to, you know, adjust and... I really, you know, want to apologize. Like that's the vulnerability piece. And that was what built connection. Yeah, it, it is about the, the vulnerability. And I agree. I think I think most people are terrified to be vulnerable. Particularly leaders. Leaders are really bad at being vulnerable. Because of course we, you know, I'm a CEO. I'm expected to know everything. Well, I don't. I'm human. I'm totally flawed, as my staff will tell you on a regular basis, um, but I'm willing to be vulnerable. And that willingness to be vulnerable is so critically important um, so that people see you as human and, and you know, give you that benefit of the doubt. Um, and it helps you to be willing to just be open and have open conversations that's great. Um, I love it. And, and mountain marketers said agree that most people need the education of someone who's willing to help with this education. Right on. I mean, so we've got someone like you obviously writing a book, you know, so if you're a CEO or a boss lady or man, or, you know, them there, whoever, what kind of boss you are, I think uh, you can then um, uh, read a book like this to be able to change the system. But also, how did they get um, how do they find that person that will educate them? Like, you don't want to necessarily put that onus on um, on the, the person who's, who's, you know, diverse. So what other resources do you recommend? Like, how do you implement it? Well, don't use Google. <laughs> don't go you can find some terrifying things on Google. Um, I, you know, I think um, word of mouth is, is the best approach. Um, and there are some fantastic people working in this space in inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility um, in, you know, Canada, the United States, Europe, you know, this has become a real profession. Um, and the best thing you can do is talk to your other organizations or so talk to your CEO friends and say, have you hired a consultant in this space? Who do you know in this space? And get a recommendation, get a referral. The problem is the profession is sort of like the Wild West. Yeah. Like there's a whole lot of snake oil salesmen. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who just sort of wake up one day and they're like, I'm a diversity expert. What? How did, how did that happen? Um, and, and truthfully, you know, I fell into this profession. I was just really lucky to be, and I, I, I led diversity for, for an accounting firm and, and had the opportunity to do that. I was lucky. Um, you know, you wanna make sure that the person who you're getting to advise you, to educate you, really does know what they're talking about. So get some referrals, some references rather and make sure that that person is, is kind of up to par. So Caitlin wrote, Kate Fitz, Dr. Leah, how can parents teach their kids from a young age? And I think, you know, I was talking earlier about how do we, we really need to ground up and that's my parenting thing, which is that, you know, when it comes to raising kids to really be accepting of every kind of gender, every kind of race, it's, it's a question of, trying to take the gender pronouns out of the language. Like I'll try to, you know, when a group of kids come over, I call them kids. Try not to say boys, girls, you know, I'll just say, hey kids, you know, just because I just try to keep the language out if I can. I mean, I don't always succeed, but, um, and then other things I try to do is um, 
is to uh, to offer like a di you know uh, a, a diverse like opportunities for different kinds of clothing or toys or you know whatever they I have like race cars I have you know Barbies like I just have it all I'm like to see what they gravitate towards I don't like you know try to make it all about that and then the other thing is that I try to do is um, role model so I have had my kids spend weekends with you know a single sex female couple with uh with uh, uh, another friends who are one is one is black and one is you know white and so like they can sort of see like there are so many ways to have a family like you know this is one way this is another way and so I'll say you know take my kid for the weekend because I think in the, there's no better way to learn about this than you know having mentors and I think that's the way that they're really going to be open minded um, and I think so far they're they don't they don't talk a lot about race like for them they're just like everybody's the same they're like so cool that way you know they don't even think about it um maybe they will more when they get older but right now they have friends of every color of every spectrum of you know mentors godparents whatever you want to say i just think yeah. that's the way to well bias is a learned behavior the kids don't wake up homophobic or racist they learn it from their parents they learn it from other kids from teachers and if we normalize these things from a very early age, then it just becomes part of life. And we're seeing this so much more, particularly around gender identity with younger kids that are coming out as non-binary and gender queer and gender diverse and trans at very young ages. And that's because they just have an openness about gender because they've been taught an openness about gender. And if you normalize sexuality, like my niece, she's eight years old, going on 18, anyway. Um, she grew up, I mean, her whole life, she's had my husband and I in her life, and we're very close with her. And so for her, there is no question of, can two men be together? Can two women be together? There's just, it's not, you know, it's part of life. Yeah, well, you're leading by example, which is the best way to lead. So, right. you know, as parents, like, if you don't have a very diverse community or you don't have a lot of, you know, single sex, you know, relationship friends, like, seek them out and find them and then give your children the opportunity. Like, if there's a, you know, a Latinx kid in the cat, you know, class, like, find the parents, set up a play date. Like, that's how you really create you know, a kid who's growing up, I've seen it all already. Like, nothing surprises me. My kids don't even bat an eyelash. They didn't even say, why does that person have two moms? Or they don't, they just, like, I already explained it to them. I explained to them about this IVF and, uh, you know, how the kids are born, even if they, you know, it's not a penis and a vagina. And they know all that stuff. They've been raised that way. I don't even think, I mean, it's, to me, it's been so easy, you know, um, to, to raise kids this way. So that's what I would suggest, find appropriate role models. That's really yeah. the best. Yeah, it's, it, that's absolutely it. I think if we, if we create shame or mystery around something, then it creates bias or it creates innate curiosity, right? Like if we tell kids we can't, they can't do something, they're gonna wanna do it more. <laughs> so the best thing you can do, and, and I gotta say, you know, anyone thinking that teaching your kids about sexuality at a young age is going to somehow turn them queer. That's not how it works. They either are or they are not. So teaching them about it as a young age takes the shame out of it. Yeah. And, and that's what we should be doing with kids today. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think you don't create what's already in them. Only thing you do is create a horrible amount of for you. And I believe very strongly that, um, if you take the shame out of you know, the gender issue by saying, you know, you can express your gender in lots of ways growing up. Like you can dress like, a, you know, more like a boy, like masculine. You can dress more like a girl. And I'm going to be great with however you choose to dress because I realize that, you know, there's a lot of ways to express yourself. Then you don't create all that dysphoria. And then you don't get like the, the suicidal ideation and the I hate myself and the depression, all those things that go along with transitioning. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's my thought. So, you know, let's start from this, this, 
scratch and also change the workplace. So we're going to sign off soon because my battery's running out. Is there any other, you know, tips about your book or, you know, anything else you want to hear? About today? Well, you know, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, my, um, the one thing about my book is that it's applicable outside of the workplace. Yeah. It's, it, you know, there's lots of stuff in there that really resonates with a, a wider audience. Uh, the other thing I would say is I have a new book coming out and cause you know, who doesn't love to release two books within a year? Um, it, <laughs> such an idiot, such an idiot. Anyway, it's called Alphabet Soup, the quintessential guide to LGBTQ2 plus inclusion. And it will be available March 22nd, 29th, 29th uh, of next year. And I'm really excited about it because it, it goes well beyond the workplace. It is just around how do you create LGBTQ2 plus inclusive spaces, which can be workplaces, they can be schools, they can be religious organizations. Uh, it's, yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. I'm pretty excited about it. That's awesome. Well, um, it's Gay Pride Month, so. It is. It is the perfect time. <laughs> it, is. it is the perfect time. And, um, and yeah, I mean, this is great stuff. So thanks so much for talking to me today. And uh, My pleasure. Thanks for chatting with me. Fun. All right. Well, take care, Michael. Bye. Thanks. Have a good weekend.